Financial Phil is holding, and uh, I've activated his button. He's ready to go. Can't keep him back. Can't hold him back any longer. <laughs> Phil, good morning. Good morning, guys. How are you all? We're well. I think we are. <laughs> Did you notice when Rob activated your button? Did you see char- electrical oh, charges yeah. going everywhere? <laughs> no, I thought it was activated a long time ago. I always hear a little bit of static, and I've always my assumption has always been that's when you could hear me. So I, yes. I thought I was activated a long time ago. Oh, no. Yeah, that's what I said. I've activated his button. That You hear that if you're on hold, for those of you who have never been a guest on the program via telephone. When you, you call in, somebody else answers the phone. You get put on hold. That Today would be either Kresha or Colin. You get put on hold, and then you're just kind of like in limbo. You're just there. You're floating in telephone outer space until I hit your button. Once I hit your button, you hear a ksh. That's an electric zap that gets the guests going, so they got lots of energy, a little electroshock, ksh, like that. Can't have a flat guest, Phil. Did, I heard that. <laughs> That's right. So I assume you, since you felt that charge, Phil, you, you will not be a flat guest? I'm ready to go, guys. I'm ready to go. The futures markets this morning are up today. Everybody's up by at least a half percent. It was a down day across the Asian continent today, but the European markets are all strongly positive. Phil, why the big difference? Uh, I don't don't know. There's a a lot of information coming out today as far as on the retail side. Uh, We'll pay close attention to that. And again, not so much about what uh, Target in particular, but not so much about what Target, how Target performed as far as profits, but their forward-looking statements. Because everything we're trying to figure out right now, and that was clear last week, everything that we're trying to figure out, and it's getting to be an old story, but it is accurate, is what's the Federal Reserve going to do in to combat inflation? And so we try to read these data points, and last week was a huge week for it. We try to read these data points to say, hey, this is what this will make the Federal Reserve do or not do or increase or pause or whatever it may be and then we play that forward well last week we we weren't happy with the pce and now that was kind of evident because the cpi and the ppi and all the other indicators had told us as such but man we still have a strong consumer and we're still consuming we're still consuming so much that our inflation didn't drop as much as what we had hoped so that pace of inflation or that slippery slope that we hoped for with inflation has kind of stalled a bit, therefore stalling our market some. You know, it's, it's not that bold of a statement because we're early into the year, but it was the worst week of the year. Well, that's, we're only seven weeks into it, but that was down 3%. And I encourage everybody to look at a bigger picture because we keep talking, even all the headlines you see, we keep talking about this rally that we've had so far in 2023, and it's accurate. We've still had a pretty decent 2023 to this point. But go back to the last quarter of 2022, and that's really when it started. You know, where our markets have done well since. And there's been bumps in the road, and getting better is not a straight line up. So we're going to have weeks like last week. We're, we're, we're not, you know, as, as far as investors are concerned, we get kind of over our skis a little bit when we hear Jerome Powell say something or we get a report that makes us happy or sad. But since last October, October 1st, the S&P is up 10%. That's pretty good. You know, you got a, a not a huge time frame there, but that's pretty good. And that's not back to where we were at the beginning of 2022. I'm not trying to suggest that. But regaining that is more normal. It's not going to be like it was. Of course, we've already we've already surpassed that. It's not going to be like it was in during the early COVID days. But it, it, but we this is what recovery looks like. You know, it, it, we question it sometimes. We're still fearful sometimes of what had made us fall in 2022, which was inflation and the Federal Reserve, and and we're still combating that. And we did, we hadn't gone as far as what we had hoped, so we gave some of it back last week. What do you expect to hear this? I uh, see see you here this week, Phil. Um, I expect to hear much of the same, quite honestly, and I think that's already baked in, which may be why we're green. Uh, Target is is a big one today, and we get housing and manufacturing data. This week, while that that is important, it's not as important as these other reports, these inflation reports that we've seen. But the the company earnings, it's real, it's it's interesting right now. These company earnings are telling us how strong the consumer is. Typically, in regular markets, we like to see a strong labor market. We like to see strong consumers, but those are inflationary pressures. And right now, we're trying to combat inflation. And as we combat inflation, it messes with the cap bill model and how we price stocks. 
in especially growth companies. That's why the NASDAQ has, has moved more and some of these big tech companies move more than others uh, one way or the other, whether it's good or bad. And so it's kind of reverse. You know, it's just back to that same old narrative. Good news is bad news and bad news is good news on the economic front as it pertains to the markets. What about supply chain? We we heard a lot about that a few months ago. It's not mentioned as much in the news these days. Is that still a factor or a major factor? It, it is, but it's improved, and it's improved a great deal, and that's one of the reasons why we've had, uh, so, and, and some of that from the reopening of China, but that's why we've had one of the reasons we've had uh, a, a slowdown in inflation and our markets reacting the way that they have, and the Federal Reserve reacting the way that they have. In December, they only did half a percent this last time. They did a quarter of a percent. Now what's on tap for the Federal Reserve, and where there's a lot of different opinions, will they do a quarter of a percent or will they go back up to a half a percent? Last week and all these inflation reports that we've gotten in February kind of give us an indication that maybe they're going to do half a percent, which is ramping up those increases in, in rates yet again. The train derailment in Ohio, uh, will that have a significant impact upon the market? I'm not talking about so much today as potential increased or enhanced uh, regulations. Uh, not that, I've, not that okay. I can see. I mean, if, if it is, it's going to be minimal, and it will be far out in the future. But, you know, there's, there's nothing that happened with that train derailment that I think would impact our markets. Our, our focus is solely, and, it, and I can't stress this enough, it is solely – on the on inflation but but more better said the movement of interest rates and it is a tired story and sometimes it's hard to grasp what some economical or even events that happen in our society what impact it will have on the markets but if it doesn't disrupt the supply chain too much or if it doesn't encourage the consumers to spend too much and that's part of our problem you know is in in you know, we look for this. You know, we talk about Santa Claus rally. Well, that's based off of a strong consumer and consumer spending money. But you know, kind of right now, we want people to slow down a bit, and we've seen consumer confidence come up, and we see people spending money. It's like, dang, that demand is still there, and all that they have done to this point hasn't slowed us down at all. And there, you know, there's another narrative that it's rarely spoken about. But it is like we see a bump in our markets and we see a bump in our 401Ks and we kind of breathe easy a little bit. And even though that's not money that we're, we're set to spend, it does make us feel better about our own personal situation, even though it could be money you don't touch for 30 years. But it makes you feel better. If your 401K balance or TSP or whatever it may be, if it looks better than it did the previous month or however, whatever that time frame is that you kind of glance and look at your statements, you know, some do it every day, some do it quarterly, some monthly, just depends on your personality. But it does make you feel a little bit more confident and more likely to spend money, even though that's not the pile of cash you're going to to get to spend in most cases for, for, for working consumers in most cases, but it does make you more likely to spend money. So there's this dark narrative, I guess, that people would say that the Federal Reserve is trying to keep the stock market down because the stock market encourages consumer spending at some time, at some point. Are there any, uh, uh, any bills posed in, uh, on the federal level or even the state level that's going to have a impact upon the market? No, not that I can see right, you know, right now. And, and you know, we stress this quite often, that it's, it's rare that something long-lasting comes from the political side of things. Of course, there's spending packages that sometimes it either relieves inflation or increases inflation. Tax, tax code will oftentimes do that. So when we get a uh, go back to 2017 with the Trump tax cuts, that really encouraged spending and consumers uh, going out there and spending money, which in turn, you know, in a normal market causes companies to make more money, and we we're all happy about that, and our markets cheered it. So tax code will often do that because it restricts the budget or increases the budget of the normal American family. But as as far as I can see right now, there's no uh, that I'm aware of anyway that there's no major tax code or tax cuts or tax increases that are on the horizon, especially none that's that's ready to pass. What did pass that will impact, I don't know that it really impacts markets, but it will impact savings, is Secure Act 2.0. You know, we've been talking about Secure Act 2.0 for quite some time, and it will take a while before we see that inside of our retirement plans and some of the benefits and 
and changes that have taken place for the worker, especially those over 50, Secure Act 2.0 was significant. And it really did change the face of how we save money. And you know, a lot of are calling it the Rothification of uh, retirement plans. And I think that's accurate. You know, there's so many things in there that it's encouraging people to put money into Roth. And, and what that simply means is you're going to pay tax on it now, but it will grow and come out tax free. And of course, as financial planners, we're big fans of that. Some may not be big fans of it when they go to make catch-up contributions. If your income is over 145.5, I think is is the number. If your income is over that and you're making catch-up contributions, which are for available for those over the age of 50, so you've hit your max out this as much as I can put in in any given year, which is 22.5. When now you, and you've always had a catch-up contribution available past the age of 50. Now it's at, for this year it's 7,500. So the regular 51-year-old can put $30,000 away. And, you know, not a lot of people can do that, but some can. And with those catch-up contributions, if your income exceeds a certain level, those must go to Roth, which means you're going to pay taxes on those dollars. And so, and, and in conjunction with that, employers, so, and so all employees, if you're into this Roth, and if you talk to us, you probably are, if you're into this Roth idea, employers have the ability now to elect to allow employees to put employer contributions to the Roth side. We're big fans of that. Before, that wasn't an option. Even if you had a Roth option in your plan, you couldn't say, hey, Mr. Employer, go ahead and put what you're putting in my plan for me into Roth, and I'll pay taxes on it now. But remember, don't have to worry about it later on in life if I follow the rules and, and wait until 59 and a half and spend there five years and all that fun stuff. But the but now you can elect that. So you could, in theory, if you're over the age of 51, you could be putting thirty, forty, forty-five thousand dollars a year away if you can afford it in Roth. You know, thirty on your side and then whatever the employer's putting away for you in Roth and go ahead and pay taxes on it. We're huge fans of that. Huge fans of that. And in conjunction with that, once you get to the ages, and, and, and don't quote me on this because be, I may be missing a year. It was kind of weird, but age 61 through 64, you could do 150% catch-up contribution. So they've really opened this up to where you can stuff a lot of money away savings-wise for employees. And I know you may be thinking right now, like, well, I can't put that much money. What's the big deal about that? Well, the theory is later on in life, once your children are gone and they're through college and you've got your bills paid off, that's really a prime time for savings, and they've opened that up to allow you to stuff more away. Is that effective in 2023, Phil, or 2024? Some of it are going through in 2023, some in 2024, but plans for 1K providers, are because it was so late in the year, so, so understandably so, they're having a hard time catching up with. I've yet to see a plan that has adopted. I'm sure there's some out there. But I've yet to see a plan that have a, that have adopted some of those rules. But most of them will go into effect in 2024. Some are optional for 2023. You just plan providers have to catch up with it. In some cases, you need employees to ask for it because if you're setting back in a plan, it's like man, this has been this for years, and you've got you know someone in HR that it's not it's not on their agenda to change the the retirement plan. You need employees to say, hey, this is I understand this is available now. And and this is this is what we want. Where what are your all stances on this? It doesn't cost the employer any more money to allow. They don't care. It doesn't matter to them whether the employees' contributions are going to Roth. So that that's something that in in some cases just for the for the election for employer contributions go that has to be elected. Phil, I'm going to make you happy here and uh, ask you to kind of approach this from a more philosophical financial planner standpoint here instead of asking you about specific market trends, okay? So get that big smile on your face right now. <laughs> you know you know, we do like that. So, in, in, And if you're, if you're asking about, you know, the Rothification that came through with Secure Act 2.0, and, and again, this is part of the spending package. So, you know, you may not have liked the spending package, but this was part of it and it did have bipartisan support. But from a financial planner standpoint, this last year aside, we know that money is going to grow over time. We know that as long as you don't make terrible mistakes when markets fall by selling out when it gets to the bottom, and that tends to be some some people's ideas like, oh, boy, we got to sell this out before it goes to zero. But as long as you allow it to play out, 
and if you're if you're a, a, an investor or, or 401k or or if you've had money in the market, you've seen it recover before. You've been there, done that, and it, it will grow. So the the Roth side of that equation, this is why we're such big fans of it. On the Roth side of the equation, you go ahead and pay taxes on it, but it grows and comes out tax free if you follow the rules of the plan and you don't you know tap into it immediately. But so it grows and comes out tax free. The flip side to that is the, the deferred tax portion. It's not tax free; it's deferred. You know, we get that instant gratification when we make a deposit into a traditional IRA or a traditional 401k or TSP or whatever it may be. We get that instant gratification because it reduces our income. So if you make a hundred grand a year and you put six grand into a Roth, you're only or into a traditional. I'm sorry, traditional IRA or 401k, you're only paying taxes on ninety four thousand. So instantly, you're like, hey, I pay less taxes. However, that 6000 then over time, it will grow. Regardless of this past year, it will grow. And when it grows and then you're using those funds in retirement, it's 100% taxable. So this, this fallacy that a lot of us think, like, oh, we'll be in a lower tax bracket once we retire. Well, no, you won't. Not if all of your funds are in tax deferral. It is just, it's probably not going to happen. Now, hold that thought so, right there. Okay, yeah. because this is what my question was going to be, right? So I remember my first job out of college. Well, this is going back 38 years now. But that was the whole philosophy, which was you want to defer money because when you're older, you'll be in a lower tax bracket. And I used to think to myself, well, why will I be in a lower tax bracket when I'm older if I'm question. saving all this money now and it grows at 11% on average a year for 40 years? Won't I be in a higher tax bracket? When did the philosophy switch to... Wait a second. You might not actually be in a lower tax bracket. You might actually need to be in a more tax advantage situation with the Roth. When did well, that philosophy started, switch? We started. The Roth came about 1998, and there was a reason for that. And I, and I think it was you know a lot of people seeing that in retirement, especially once required minimum distribution started. Even if you didn't need the money, even if you said, "Hey, I don't want to," that was another thing. Secure Act 2.0 did was push that out a little bit more, but. Even if you didn't need the funds, he's like, well, I don't, I don't need this. They're going to make you take money out of those tax deferred accounts because they, you haven't paid your bill yet. And in a way, I've always looked at tax deferred money, and we've all got it. And some, you couldn't avoid it up until this year, and you really still can't until employee, employers elect it. But you have, you, you have a, a bill. You have to pay the IRS a bill. Period. And once that comes out at age now, it's age seventy three, unless you'd already started. So once that starts to come out, that's taxable income. You don't have to be spending it. You don't have to, you know, be paying your bills with it and and, and just getting by. You, maybe you don't even need it, but it still has to come out. Now that doesn't mean you have to take it. You can reinvest it in a non qualified account. You can still continue to let it grow, but it's tax, right? So and that's not all of it, but just a portion of it. So then you throw in your Social Security and all of your living expenses that are required, especially if you have a pension. And the next thing that you know, you look down and you see that you're in this, in most cases, you're in the same tax bracket you were before. And God forbid you have a an emergency or, or maybe you plan the big vacation for everyone and you have to have a big, huge distribution from a taxable account, you very well may find yourself from time to time in a higher tax bracket than what you were when you were working because of all this deferred income. So we're huge fans of this Roth ideal because now that gives me options. You know, so if I'm in a 12 or in, not to mention you know, the jump in the tax code from 12 to 22 percent is staggering. It's 10 percent jump if you go over a certain level. But you may find yourself like I'm on the cusp of this 20, this 12 percent or this 22 percent doesn't really matter. I'm on the cusp. And I want to take my family to Disney. You know, that's a that's a fairly common uh, thing that people do. They'll take their kids and their grandkids to Disney, and I need to pull somebody out in order to do that. Well, look what you just did. You know, I got taxed at possibly 22 percent, where you knew you fell in a 12 percent bracket because you didn't have another place to go. Well, Roth money, while it shows up on your tax return, has no impact on your taxes, so it's tax free. That we love that. We love that ability. I want to pick and choose. When I pull money out, I want to pick and choose how it's going to be taxed. 
that's diversification that you could do something about. And as we've seen over the past year, we really can't control the markets. We don't know what's going to happen. We have an idea, but, and eventually that it's going to grow, but we don't know when that's going to be. But if we can control to some extent anyway – your tax situation, man, it's beautiful. Now, That's a beautiful I, I wanna, place to be. My second question for you has to do with these re- required minimum distributions, RMDs, and you mentioned that because of Secure uh, Act 2.0, these edges have been pushed back to now, what, 73. Uh, one of the things that uh, has now been brought up as a consideration is in regards to these RMDs is that it can actually, you have to be careful here because you, you push the age back, but... It just increases the amount you've got to start taking out when you're 73, which could push your Medicare premiums into a whole nother uh, bracket. Yep. Uh, so you have to be careful pushing these RMDs back. Yep, and it takes work. So, you know, as you're, as you're ramping up on these RMD ages, and, and I'm going to throw another caveat. I know we're running out of time, but in 2020 and 2033, that age jumps to 75. So for someone in there, you know, that's 10 years out from RMDs, if you're 62 right now, you'll have until age 75. But it allows more time for financial planning. So if you're someone that retires at a normal age, 65 to 67 is, is, the, is a typical age, well, now you've got five or six years to plan for that. And how do you plan for that other than Roth conversion? So I'm taking this taxable money, and I'm going to convert it up to a point where I remain in a good tax bracket or remain in my current tax bracket. I'll go ahead and pay taxes on it. I'm going to start taking some of it out, even though you're not making me. The payments aren't due until 73, but I'll go ahead and start making payments on it so they're not so bad, and you don't run in that situation that you're talking about. Therefore, when I get to age 73 or age 75, the RMDs are actually lower because they gave me more time to 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 plan for that, for plan plan for uh, to move money over onto the Roth side. So now, as I've done that later on or early on in my retirement years, before those required distributions started, okay, I'll go ahead and take the required distribution that I had. Maybe I do some qualified charitable distributions. That helps. I do some get QCDs, as we'll call them. But when I have an expense that kind of falls outside of the norm, I can go to those those Roth accounts and pull money from there and not have to worry about the taxes on it. Phil, we're just about out of time. How do we get in touch with you for more information on the things we've talked about today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and sit with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg.